Well, welcome back to our series, uh, Looking Unto Jesus. Um, two lessons ago, we, um, I told you we were going to talk about the sanctifying power of the gospel, the gospel as a motivation for our sanctification, and that we were going to look at three quotes. Well, we're two lessons into this one lesson, and we still have two quotes to go. So we've been looking at, I think, many important truths, primarily that the gospel the beauty, the power of Jesus Christ and what he has done, that is what adds the impulse, the, the earnestness to the preacher. And the more that we seek to discover the glories of Christ in the gospel, the more we are going to be empowered for obedience and for ministry. And the more we are going to have that essential key element in every good minister, which is perseverance, perseverance to just keep going. We say here uh, that we don't have many racehorses. Matter of fact, we don't have any, but we have a lot of mules and a lot of plow horses, men who every day can put one foot in front of the other and just keep going. So uh, to begin, well, in this one, I promise we're going to get to John Calvin and George Whitfield, but I want to start off with a quote from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. It's one of my favorite passages and is so applicable to the minister today, especially the minister who is worn out, who is tired. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. For the love of Christ controls us again, not Paul's love for Christ, but Christ's love for Paul. I know as a minister of the gospel that you're a lot like me, probably stronger, but we do have some similarities and when I look in the mirror at my love for Christ, there's not to there's not much there to animate me. Um, sometimes there's evidence that there's need for lament. My love for Christ is not consistent. It is not overwhelming. It is not empowering. But when I look in the scriptures and I see Christ's love for me, his immutable eternal, unconditional, unwavering love for me. Now that's motivation. You know, there is a need to talk about sin and there's a need to talk about sin in the minister's life. And there are ministers who are fraudulent, who are hypocritical, who are carnal. That is true. But what I have discovered is that Christ's true ministers good men, sincere men, without hypocrisy. These men grow tired and these men waver. And these men also can have doubts. What will it be for me on that day when I step over into glory? It, it, it seems as though so many ministers aware of their weaknesses and many failures think that the that a scowl, a divine scowl awaits them when they step over into glory. Let me ask you a question. Do you really think that God sent his own son and that that son came as a man, bore your guilt, died having suffered your wrath, rose again from the dead, triumphing over death and hell and the grave and all that is demonic. Do you really think that all that was accomplished so that the first thing you see when you walk into heaven is a scowl up on your savior's face? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I, I hear of joy unspeakable and full of glory. I hear of a God who is able to make even someone as weak as me to stand and not just stand, but with great joy. Minister, always remember 
There's only one hero in this story, and it's not you, it's not me, it's not Charles Spurgeon, it's Jesus Christ. He has accomplished it all, and that's the motivation for our life. Paul says, for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, you need to conclude this. You need to seriously consider this text and conclude some things. What did Paul conclude? That one died for all, therefore all died. That life we had before, we're dead to it. Not as some monastic work of drudgery. We're dead to it. We just don't want it because we've seen him. We've caught a glimpse of him. Therefore all died and he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. You know, if we look, look through uh, Romans six, we see that living for ourselves just resulted in shame. There was no lasting joy to it. Isn't it amazing? The secular man has only this life to live for, nothing else, nothing really to die for. What a present, what a gift God has given you and me and that we actually have something to live for. We actually have something to die for. So many people involved in politics and maybe their man wins and for four years they see an advancement in, in their goals only to see another man take his place and crush everything that was done prior. But see, in, in our kingdom, there's no changing of the guard. There's no election. There's no Congress. There's no Senate. There's no one to be voted in or out. We have an all sovereign and good king and a kingdom that he makes sure to advance. And we're a part of that and we're allowed to work in it. You and I, brethren, we have something to live for and something to die for. And another thing, just so you know, don't get caught up in all these things about notoriety and presence on the Internet and conference speaking and all that. All of that is in part vanity. The backbone of the kingdom of heaven are pastors who labor in anonymity, temporal anonymity, not eternal, because one day those who were well known will be shown to be little. And those who weren't known at all will be exalted. We have something to live for, to die for. That we might no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. It's not just that he died and that's it. And now we follow him into the same sort of martyrdom. He died and rose again. And we know that if we die to self, we will rise again. We know that if we die as martyrs, we will rise again. We know that if we die suffering terribly, we will rise again. We will rise again. And when everyone's lamp is being put out, I think as one philosopher said, his lamp was being put out because the sun was rising. We have a lot to look forward to, brethren. So put your hand to the plow and, and let's work because we're not working to be loved. We're working because we are loved. Nothing can change that. Do you really think your sin is greater than the blood of Christ. Now, it was the love of Christ revealed through the gospel that made the Apostle Paul a most eminent servant of God. Not Paul's love for Christ, but Christ's love for Paul. This truth has been affirmed over and over throughout church history. I have in my more than three decades met so many saints who were extraordinary in their devotion. But it was only because they had an extraordinary glimpse of an extraordinary love. And that is found in the scriptures. Now we get to our quotes. Finally, to the two last quotes, the first by John Calvin. 
and it is wonderful. The more extraordinary the discoveries which have reached us of the Redeemer's kindness, the more strongly are we bound to his service. You see, he's saying the same thing. He really is. Let's read it again. The more extraordinary the discoveries which have reached us of the Redeemer's love, the more we discover about his love, the more strongly we are bound to his service. He's saying exactly what Paul said. But now I want to look at this not only for ourselves, but as preachers, as ministers of Christ. The more extraordinary the discoveries which have reached us. Let me ask you a question. How many discoveries have reached your people? Of the extraordinary love of the Redeemer. Do you see your study? As a gold mine, as a gem mine, as a diamond mine, where you go in there to discover greater realities, greater things about our Redeemer's love and to be able to present those discoveries to God's people. It is true. We must preach law and precepts and principles and practical wisdom. It's very, very true. But God's bride cannot survive on those alone. She needs the main course which must always be Christ himself, a greater knowledge of their savior, of her savior. Now let's go on. We'll finish with George Whitfield. I love this, this statement. The death of Jesus Christ has turned our whole lives into one continued sacrifice. A living sacrifice, a holy and acceptable sacrifice. But I think maybe. Maybe above all those other terms, those adjectives, a willing sacrifice. A person so overjoyed in what Christ has done for them that they beg Christ to take their life. And use it for his glory. And whether we eat or drink, whether we pray to God or do anything to man, it must all be done out of love for and knowledge of him who died and rose again. If anything replaces Christ in his gospel as the primary motive, then I would say we're headed down the course of idolatry. You know, I know that Christ can fix a broken marriage. But people don't come to Christ to get a marriage fixed. They come to Christ because of Christ. They come to Christ. Because of Christ. We should come to Christ and worship even if the only thing promised us was hell. Because he is worthy. He is worthy. It must all be done out of love for and knowledge for him who died and rose again to render all, even our most ordinary deeds, acceptable in the sight of God. You know, um, for the when we talk about the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there are no ordinary persons. Everyone is a son or daughter of God. There are no ordinary persons. And you know what? There are no ordinary deeds. What could be more ordinary than giving someone a glass of water? What could be more ordinary? Even I can prepare a glass of water. And yet Jesus says they will not lose their reward, that it is noticed in heaven as an extraordinary thing when done in the name of Christ. You see, um, everything becomes important. A smile, a word of encouragement, 
a, a small deed of service. Whether it's washing dishes for your wife or mowing a, a believer's yard. It's all extraordinary now because we're in an extraordinary kingdom that belongs to an extraordinary Lord. Well, we've turned uh, one study into three, but I hope it's been helpful. I hope it strengthens you in your inner person and that you will be a more faithful, more confident, more joyful servant of Christ. And this is why we read old books. God bless you.